I realized that there were solutions happening on the ground. There were new business models that were not only making a profit, but also positively contributing to uh, the health of the planet and um, the well-being of people. Um, and, and that's how sort of my commitment to, to climate change uh, um, uh, started really through the realization that, that the climate change challenge touches on most of the other global challenge that we're facing. Marianne Verlis is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media and Innovators Magazine. Marianne is the CEO of SustainCert, a mission-driven company that offers simple tech-driven solutions for verifying impacts on climate protection, supply chains, and investment products. Marianne brings to SustainCert her deep knowledge of carbon markets and her passion for pioneering new approaches to financing climate and development interventions. Prior to launching SustainCert, Marianne officiated as CEO of the Gold Standard Foundation, a standard that works to ensure every dollar of climate and development funding goes as far as it can. She also founded Nexus Carbon for Development, a cooperative of development organizations looking to scale their climate mitigation programs through result-based finance. Before joining the climate and development arena, Marianne worked at Barclays Bank as a corporate development analyst. She holds a master's degree in European business and a master's in, in public administration. Marianne, it is so good to have you here. Welcome to the show. How are you? Thanks, Mark. I'm really well. Thank you. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here and thank you for having me. Uh, I, I'm so excited to have you. We're, we have tons of things to discuss. I, I believe we could probably go a few hours because uh, there's a lot of burning topics that uh, I would like to cover and go over with you today. Um, first and foremost, though, uh, you're, you're, I probably could have went on forever about your background and your biography. You've been in this uh, arena for a little while and done some amazing things since you started at a very high uh, level, I would like to know um, how that has prepared you, I hope, to weather this pandemic and how have you been through this pandemic time? Has any of that pre-history and knowledge and experience thinking about the future helped you to weather this storm a little bit better? Thanks, Mark. That, that's a great question. And, and to, be, to be honest and, and very candid in my response, I, I don't think anyone was prepared for the pandemic. And I don't feel that I was better prepared than anyone else. Um, it's, been, it's been quite, a, uh, quite an intense year, to be honest. And um, uh, the pandemic did uh, bring about uh, 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 some of the issues that I've been working on for many years now, uh, sort of bring those issues uh, uh, to the front page of the, of the news, uh, of the newspapers. And it's also helped uh, raise awareness on the interconnectivity between human health and planetary health. So to that extent, I find that some of the outcomes of the pandemic were were positive in, uh, in helping people really realize how, how much we as human beings are connected to the well-being of the earth. Uh, uh, but overall, it's, uh, it's, it's been a, a really intense and, and really challenging time, I think, for everyone. I, am, I imagine. Um, is there any great stories or interesting stories that you can tell me about your your partners, your clients, or things that you saw where, you know, maybe, maybe somebody came and said, yep, we spoke before the pandemic and you were telling us we should maybe advising us and now we're ready. Now we're ready. Or any, any other kind of stories where you've seen this, this shift positive or negative in any way, just kind of give us a little more insight if possible. Yeah, it's, it's, it's true that, that the pandemic has, has confirmed uh, uh, sustainability strategies were not only a good thing to have, but really a must have from a company perspective. 
uh, I think it did contribute to, to making sustainability more uh, central to the agenda of many corporates globally. Um, however, the economic downturn that's coming uh, uh, in the aftermath of the pandemic is, is going to create sort of budget squeeze and, and financial pressures that may uh, 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 to some extent sort of slow down uh, some of the sustainability commitments that were uh, made previously. Uh, so whilst the awareness is, is, is increasing, uh, we're, we're still slightly concerned that the investment flows and the delivery side may be a little bit slowed down uh, by the economic downturn. Uh, on the positive side, though, because I like to see uh, the glass uh, half full, I would say that two very concrete positive outcomes, especially in our sector. Uh, uh, first is the fact that we now can much more easily uh, uh, as a community of sustainability professional uh, uh, do work uh, and meet virtually uh, uh, without feeling the need to fly all over the world. And that's a good thing. Uh, uh, since everyone is grounded, uh, um, uh, we uh, have developed new ways to interact and do business together uh, without necessarily feeling the, the, the need to, to jump on the flight uh, every time there's a conference uh, popping up. Uh, uh, so that's great. I think the second thing that's um, really positive is the fact that consumer awareness uh, uh, has increased. Uh, uh, consumer awareness um, for uh, the need to, to change um, uh, uh, towards more sustainable lifestyles or pay attention to the sustainability profile of goods uh, uh, has increased uh, during the pandemic and hopefully that will um, uh, strengthen the business case for sustainability strategies overall. There's definitely a few rabbit holes that we could go down with, with just that. And I'd like to touch upon them later in, in our discussion, maybe a little bit about uh, ESG business models, investing, divesting, what yeah. positive things we've seen uh, and by shifting your business models and, and, and doing those things are positive as, as um as well as you, you touched on flights and things, what we're seeing through Corsia and some other things, we'll address that later. I really would like to um, get into a little bit more of your background and what brought you to this, uh, this point, you know, Barclays, uh, banking industry, so finance and that, what, what moved you from that to where you are today? And can you tell us a little bit more about your professional uh, history and experience and, and get us up to speed there on, on this journey you've taken. Sure, so why don't I take you on a, on a journey, Mark? Uh, if that works for you, I could take you on a personal and, and professional journey. Uh, uh, so my journey through climate action and sustainable development, great. So let, let's do that then. Um, what I can do, Mark, is, is talk a little bit about why I have dedicated my, my whole career to climate action. Um, what it is to be a woman entrepreneur in Phnom Penh, Cambodia, or, or in Zurich, Switzerland. Um, why I believe carbon markets and carbon pricing more generally are <clears throat> paving the way for a system change. Uh, and why climate change could be our last battle as a global society. Um, so, so starting maybe with my uh, entrepreneurial journey in climate action. Uh, it all started during my studies. Um, I decided to take a gap year, uh, travel the world for nine months, uh, researching triple bottom line business models. Um, uh, at the time, I guess I was pretty aware about the problems, poverty, inequalities, environmental health, biodiversity loss. Um, and really I, I was looking for solutions. Uh, uh, and traveling, traveling for nine months uh, uh, allowed me to see for myself concretely on the ground uh, how climate change was interlinked with everything. Uh, climate change and food security, for example, uh, smallholder farmers in India losing their harvest uh, to drought, losing everything. Uh, climate change, for example, and, and women empowerment, right? We know that women are first and, and hardest hit by climate change, but they're also part of the solution, especially 
uh, when it comes to resilience and adaptation, uh, but also in terms of promoting more sustainable lifestyles. So, so really during that journey, um, I realized that there were solutions happening on the ground. There were new business models that were not only making a profit, but also positively contributing to uh, the health of the planet and um, the well-being of people. Um, and, and that's how sort of my commitment to, to climate change uh, um, uh, started, really through the realization that, that the climate change challenge touches on most of the other global challenge that we're facing. And, um, and, and after that nine months uh, uh, research project in, in 10 or so countries, um, I stayed in touch with some of the, um, the social entrepreneurs and NGOs that I had met on the ground uh, uh, and started developing uh, what would become Nexus for Development years later. Uh, and really the moment that, that moved me uh, the most during that, that period was uh, uh, this acute understanding of uh, the um, nexus of climate change, energy and human health. Especially when um, uh, uh, I stayed in Cambodia for a few weeks and then came back to Cambodia a few years later for a longer period of time. And, and realize that uh, globally, and it may sound completely uh, uh, unbelievable, but it's true that globally there are about 4 billion people uh, uh, around the world that don't have access to safe, clean, affordable energy, cooking energy. Uh, uh, so for you and I, when, when we're hungry, we uh, go in the kitchen, turn on the uh, uh, hot, hot pad, uh, the cooking tray, and, and then we make pasta. Or, it's clean, it's safe, it's affordable, uh, but we're among the happy few because there are 4 billion people out there that don't have access to clean and safe, uh, affordable cooking energy. And, and it creates every year uh, uh, the premature deaths of about 4 million people, uh, mostly women and children. Um, and at the same time, those inefficient, uh, expensive, unsafe uh, cooking solution also drive uh, deforestation and greenhouse gas emissions. Um, uh, uh, and that, that problem, that example, uh, uh, illustrates really powerfully how uh, uh, solving the, the, the climate issue uh, could also deliver direct benefits uh, to women and children, uh, to the health of our forest. Um, uh, as well as create new uh, uh, sources of income for communities. Uh, uh, and, and, and that's really this understanding and this realization that, that brought me to uh, uh, the climate challenge. That's fabulous. Did uh, you also then went from that um, before sustained cert to the gold standard foundation was there any actions or things before that point before you reached that point uh, that you worked yeah. on yeah absolutely and and once i sort of realized that i wanted to dedicate my career to to fighting climate change um i at the same time <clears throat> i'm i'm a, a numbers person so i like numbers i after i did my business school i worked in the financial sector in London um, uh, to pay back my student's loan, but also because I was genuinely interested in how the financial sector works and how investment decisions are being made. Uh, and with that background, I really got interested into carbon markets because I felt that those markets could be an extremely powerful way to drive finance to those clean cooking solutions that I was talking about earlier. Uh, if you can make that clean cooking device more affordable to a family in Cambodia or a family in India, uh, then they will choose that solution because it's, um, it's, uh, it's just better suited to their needs, but it needs to be affordable. And carbon markets can, can help lower that price point uh, by rewarding the uh, carbon savings that are being generated by those solutions. 
And so I realized that carbon markets could be an extremely powerful lever to drive change and finance uh, climate action and sustainable development on the ground. And that's why I went back to Cambodia in 2009 and, and worked with uh, local partners there to create Nexus for Development, which really um, uh, was a um, social enterprise dedicated to giving access to uh, uh, small companies and NGOs in developing countries to carbon finance on fair terms. Uh, carbon markets at the time, and still now, to be honest, um, uh, are dominated by developed countries' organizations that are trying to maximize their share of the cake uh, and therefore uh, leaving very little uh, to those doing the work on the ground. Uh, so the organizations, the SMEs that are producing those clean cooking solutions, those who are selling them, uh, end up with a tiny share of carbon revenues. Uh, uh, and so our work with Nexus for Development was to uh, provide better deals, better terms to those organizations on the ground and try to maximize the share of carbon finance that would go back uh, to people uh, doing the work on the ground. And so that's what I did with, um, with Nexus for Development. And interestingly enough, um, uh, most all of our partners and, and clients were uh, developing gold standard projects. Uh, so we were uh, extremely proud of, of being fully committed to the vision of the Gold Standard Foundation, which was and still is uh, uh, to maximize climate and sustainable development benefits. Uh, and so we were uh, uh, making that happen on the ground. Uh, uh, and, and that was a, a really uh, powerful experience for me to, to be on the ground, working with project developers, uh, going through the carbon certification process with them. Uh, uh, and a few years later, when I became the, the chief executive officer at the Gold Standard Foundation, I really understood what it meant uh, to apply the standard on the ground. Uh, and what it meant to be uh, selling gold standard carbon credits in the market. That's uh, big. You're really <laughs> speaking to my heart. As you know, I'm a global food reformist. I love food and, and um, I'm big on drawing down and, and really, uh, I'm a numbers person as well. So I'm in full alignment with you as that. The, the only thing with uh, being a numbers person is I really want to portray uh, those numbers to the, the, the common man and woman on our earth and help them understand what those numbers, those big percentages, numbers and, and, and mean and mean for them and how they can uh, uh, digest them and not get this ex existential angst that they say, oh my goodness, that is such a huge number or percentage. I'm overwhelmed. I don't know what to do with it. And so I love the fact that, uh, that you address that. And I believe you also break it down to the SMEs and to the common person to really understand what that means, how it affects them and how we can do something positive in the right direction. Not only as a, my, my, my big thing is this drawdown, you know, so, um, uh, Global food reform is important, empowering women, empowering girls, and rethinking refrigeration, which all has to do with not only uh, greenhouse gas emissions, carbon credits, but also food and this empowerment that really can bring us back into the safe operating spaces of our planetary boundaries, as the Stockholm Resilience Institute or Center would say as well. Do you... Um, believe through this dedication and experience, these things that you, you, you've been doing, that you're a global citizen and how would you feel if there was a world without nations, borders, walls, divisions? Uh, that's kind of my question. What, what Do you feel or consider yourself to be a global citizen and how would you feel about a world in the future that was removed of borders, walls, divisions of humanity? It's, it's a great question, Mark. And, and what, what drives me as an individual, it's, it's the really strong belief that 
what we need is, is a global language to talk about impact. And the reason why we're, we're failing um, our children, why we're um, uh, using uh, uh, the resources of the planet more can uh, replenish themselves is because we fail to appreciate uh, the full uh, picture, uh, uh, the full uh, uh, value of the impacts that um, our economic activities create. Uh, and so if we can create that global language uh, to talk about impact, if we can uh, redefine value holistically, uh, uh, beyond monetary value, but also look at the impact value of the activities that we um, undertake every day, of the decisions that we make every day, uh, either as, as citizens or as um, uh, uh, corporate people, as investors, as, as government people, uh, then I believe we can, uh, uh, we can transform um, uh, our societies and overcome uh, uh, the current challenges um, uh, that we face, uh, climate change and, as you said, um, uh, planetary boundaries. And, and you know, that's, that's this belief that, that drove me um, during my tenure at Gold Standard to develop and launch uh, a next generation standard, Gold Standard for the Global Goals, uh, to quantify and maximize climate and sustainable development impacts. I'm convinced that if we can create that global language uh, uh, to quantify impacts, if we can create consensus on uh, uh, what a unit of uh, uh, climate impact is, what a, a, a measurable uh, impact towards uh, uh, reducing biodiversity losses, if we can align on those impact metrics, uh, then we'll um, uh, have made substantial progress towards um, uh, uh, delivering against the Paris Agreement and the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, what I realized, however, uh, um, uh, during my tenure at Gold Standard, and after we launched this new standard, we were very proud of Gold Standard for the Global Goals. It was really well received back in the summer 2017 uh, by our core group uh, uh, of supportive and committed uh, uh, stakeholders. But what we realized is that, is that other players out there weren't really interested in the new standard. They didn't really see the need to change uh, course to do their work differently. Uh, and so at that point in time, it became clear to me, it was you know one of those light bulb moments um, it became clear to me that something was missing in our work. Uh, there was a missing link. As great as the new standard was, offering a comprehensive approach to quantify climate and sustainable development impacts, as great as that was, well, unless it became widely used by many actors out there, it wouldn't have so much of an impact, right? Exactly. If you design the most efficient electric car, but no one's using it, then it's not really reducing emissions. Um, and so we realized that whilst the Gold Standard Foundation as a nonprofit uh, was extremely well placed to develop high, uh, uh, we needed to create a separate vehicle uh, to take those high bar standards, uh, those best practice standards uh, to the market and make sure they were widely used um, uh, by uh, as many users as possible. Uh, so for us to scale our impact, we had to scale our user base. Uh, and that's uh, uh, why SustainSet was created. It is uh, really beautiful the way you uh, describe that, which could take us down uh, several rabbit holes. So I, I, my question was a little bit leading. So the reason I asked you about global citizens and those is, is uh, I'm also in full agreement. We need a way to communicate not only climate change, but a new global operating system for the world that's kind of a unified language that we can all understand and uh, and and grasp and you mentioned in that that a lot of even though the gold standard set this wonderful vision foundation and structure behind it and, and standard that a lot of the businesses 
didn't understand, didn't act upon it, uh, weren't aware of it, be, uh, not only from because probably communication, but just they were so used to business as usual. Um, there's a couple rabbit holes that I caveated at the beginning of that. Uh, I'm not sure if now's the time to go into them, but the reason I asked you this global citizen question is greenhouse gas emissions are global citizen. Food is a global citizen. Uh, species, birds, animals uh, are global citizens. They don't uh, adhere to borders and nations and, and those uh, de divisive uh, uh, structures that we, we have in our world. And uh, what we're talking about, not only the gold standard, but the global goals, the United Nations 17 Sustainable Development Goals, the Paris Agreement, those are all global operating systems. And uh, they are, um, not only did 197 countries come together for the first time ever and agree upon a roadmap for the future, but it is one of such that it's a brand new operating system. It's a new economy. It's a new way of equality and structure and infrastructure, sustainable infrastructure for our future to keep our planet below 1.5 degrees of warming. And so um, I, I'm hearing in your answer with communication and where we need to go, that it needs to be a global way, a unified way of, of communicating this. Um, but what I'm not hearing is your full answer on, are you on board or, or how do you really feel about that? Do you, do you agree or are you being a little poli politically correct for me? So, so I do agree, Mark, fully that, that we now have the global framework we need to um, uh, get on with the work. Uh, so, so the global framework, uh, the global frameworks are there. The Paris Agreement is there. It's setting a very clear um, uh, set of targets that uh, we collectively, as as a global society, need to meet. We also have the Sustainable Development Goals, um, uh, which are uh, uh, providing a, a similar framework. Um, uh, across the, the 17 SDGs. Uh, so, so the global frameworks are there. The question now, Mark, in my view is, how do you get companies, investors to move? How do you get people to move? How do you change the way uh, uh, purchase decisions, investment decisions, political decisions are, are made? Uh, so we know what we need to do. Uh, uh, the path is there. Uh, uh, now the question is, um, uh, how can we accelerate progress towards the Paris Agreement and the Sustainable Development Goals? What are the incentives we can create uh, uh, to accelerate the work and accelerate progress? So I belong to a group that's called the uh, um... Uh, the planetary emergency group that's from the club of rome and and uh, the un and, and some world economic forum some other players are involved in this and we've written several messages to business leaders and not only because of the pandemic for bailout but also to focus in on climate um, with that and with with many other things this pandemic has um really been a sobering experience for everybody and, and, a, and a true wake up call. And in my past experiences with businesses, uh, um, I've seen that it's always, you know, how can we please our board our you know, and how is there a profit? Is there a bottom line? Uh, sustainability is expensive. Uh, the, there, you know, there's, there's all these hesitations or reasons why we don't make that shift or that move. But I want, and I believe you know about this already, but I would like to mention it because I think it's a real important tool in this transition for uh, Sustain Cert and many others in this arena to help those SMEs and those, those organizations finally embrace and make that shift. And, 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 and that is, um, those organizations that implemented environmental social governance, divestment or investments, and applied the sustainable development goals into their business models, 
creating annual reports and actionable items and, and these things into their business models have weathered this difficult time, not just only the pandemic, Black Lives Matters and Beirut and, and uh, Hurricane Laura in, in the United States and Trumpocalypse and many other political things we don't wanna get into, um, have weathered the storm fairly good. Um, many have been, kind of been reactionary. They implemented personal protection equipment um, um, and, uh, and reactionary measures to get through the storm, but they've realized that those are just reactionary me measures. Those people who made this divestment and that change were really in a place to deliver personal protection equipment to those in need, to deliver food, digital services, and they were all in a better place because they'd already made that shift to what we're talking about, that global shift and change. And what it did is it gave them a structure with a certain amount of resilience and preparedness for this time. And they all weathered the storm better. But what's really important for businesses, and that's what I wanted to mention, and maybe is a tool that, that you guys can address if you're not doing so already, um, this, this discussion of the cost and it's expensive and now we've got an economic downturn and we don't have the money to do that. That is the absolute wrong way to think because uh, it, all we have to do is look to the New York Stock Exchange, the NASDAQ, the S&P 500, the global uh, S&P Global, the Stocks Europe 600 benchmark, the Collar Capital, Nikkei Index, and you as a former banker know Goldman Sachs, HBSC, and numerous, numerous others out there, they all weathered compared to their conventional counterparts much better. They all had resilience. Their profits, their returns went up. They um, had a form of resilience during this. And in the first, second, and third quarters, sustainable index funds lost less than their con conventional index funds. Seven out of 10 equity funds finished in the top halves of their Morningstar categories, 24 out of 26 environmental social governance tilted index funds uh, outweathered their, com their closest conventional counterparts. So public traded companies who take sustainability seriously significantly outperform across all geographies, various markets, because fossil fuels are stranded assets is what Goldman Sachs says. It's also, there's only one other commodity and it's the one that I'm passionate about looking as precarious as oil is livestock industry. And during this pandemic, we've seen major shutdowns and issues with the meat industries because they weren't prepared. So ESG risk factors leave companies exposed to global shocks. And, and I don't know if you feel the same way as coming from your, your background, yep. seeing that as well, but that <clears throat> is the proof that for many years, I don't know if you've seen as well, has always been an issue, a hesitation for people to finally go through and see, now, the, the proof is where the money is. The proof is where, regardless of the economy, that that's a better business model uh, for your company. And why not make the shift now? Sure. And, and thanks for, for raising that point, Mark. I'll, I'll come back to this issue of cost versus um, benefits in a minute. I'd like to come back to that and I'll share a couple of numbers, which I find pretty telling. But l let me first take a step back. Uh, Sustained cert, as, as you know, sustained cert was created because we realized that in order to scale our impact, we had to scale our user base and that there had to be a, an organization dedicated to <clears throat> take the amazing work of the gold standard and the amazing work that <clears throat> other best practice standards are doing. Uh, there had to be an organization dedicated to uh, uh, taking best practice standards and um, uh, making them mainstream. Uh, and that's the world, the, the, the work of Sustained Cert. Sustained Cert was, was created to uh, drive adoption of best practice impact verification standard. Uh, and so 
one area where we're currently focusing our work is in the context of corporate value chain emissions. Uh, what's really important is to understand what are the incentives we can pull uh, to accelerate progress towards the Paris Agreement and the Sustainable Development Goals. And there's no better incentive for a corporate to take action then um, uh, uh, talk about uh, potential future profits or, or potential future new market opportunities. Mm. And what's really interesting is that the 500 biggest company in the world uh, uh, did an assessment of climate related risk and climate related opportunities. And the opportunities were twice as big as the risk. So climate-related opportunities associated with new markets, new products are worth twice uh, uh, the potential cost associated with climate risk. And what's even more interesting is to uh, uh, go a step further and look at, okay, how much would it cost for those 500 biggest corporates in the world to seize those opportunities, climate-related opportunities estimated at $2 trillion roughly. Well, only a fraction of that. Um, uh, uh, so only a fraction of that as investment up from, from those corporates could unlock uh, those climate related opportunities. And when you, when you have those numbers available and you're on a really strong foot to engage with a corporate on a discussion about, okay, let's look at your carbon emissions and let's look at how we can help you verify your carbon footprint and reduce that footprint over time. And this is really the objective of the Sustained Cert uh, Value Change Program uh, uh, that was initiated with the Gold Standard Foundation and partners of the Science-Based Target Initiative was really looking at value chain emissions, which represent 40% of global emissions and work with corporates to develop uh, uh, specific credible um, greenhouse gas verification solutions to help them drive down value chain emissions, incentive, uh, provide incentives to their suppliers to reduce their emissions at the same time, and get to a point where uh, 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 from the farm where uh, uh, the food is being produced, uh, 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 cereals are being produced, or uh, crops uh, uh, are being harvested from that point to the point where uh, consumers are buying um, a, a loaf of bread or a, a, a bottle of milk that the carbon footprint is tracked, managed, reduced as, as much as possible and then communicated to uh, the end consumer. Uh, because we know that at the end of the chain, consumers are more and more willing uh, uh, to choose uh, low carbon uh, goods. So if we can make that information available to them, we provide the incentive for the entire value chain to reduce their emissions so that they can have uh, 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 the preference of the consumer at the end of the chain. And so the value chain program that we're working on with our partners has developed specific guidance for corporates in the agriculture sector. Uh, to reduce emissions at farm level, and then guidance on how to account uh, for those emissions throughout the value chain so that everyone has an incentive to take action, so that everyone at every node in the chain has an incentive to reduce their emissions, and so that ultimately we can provide to the consumer at the end of the chain a credible information on the carbon footprint of the product they're buying. And through those initiatives, uh, pre-competitive, uh, multi-stakeholder initiatives, uh, we can really make a difference. And, and I guess this is uh, uh, one of the um, uh, uniqueness of Sustained Cert. Uh, I would say there are two things that make us different. Uh, uh, the first, obviously, is our history with the Gold Standard Foundation uh, uh, and our commitment to driving a race to the top in impact verification by making best practice standards like gold standard mainstream. Uh, so, so that makes us very unique. The other thing that makes us unique is our commitment to use technology uh, uh, to make it simple, uh, to make it cost effective for corporates, governments and everyone to choose a credible impact verification solution. 
And in that context of the value chain initiative, we're rolling out a, a new system that will allow every single player in the value chain to track their emissions and be incentivized to reduce their emissions to a point where we can credibly uh, uh, communicate to the customer what the real carbon footprint of the good they are buying is. Uh, and that's a, that's a real breakthrough uh, uh, from a technology perspective, but more importantly, from a collaboration perspective, uh, having all uh, 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 agri-food uh, companies work together around the table uh, 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 to co-create solutions to shared problems. Uh, uh, it's a new way of working. Uh, uh, which is um, uh, uh, accelerating uh, um, uh, grandly the, the, the time at which we can develop solutions and take those solutions to market. That is so beautiful. And, and uh, I, I, I love those type of solutions. Uh, the agriculture, seafood, food and beverage industry uh, uh, industries are actually the biggest industries in the world. It's our human resource. It's where we get our energy from. It's the most vital. It's the, it's the agrarian society, the most longest running successful economies our world has ever seen. But it also has had the biggest impact on, on our climate and on our human health and, and our, our world. And so by digitizing this industry, by changing and globally reforming how we do things instead of doing it the way we started in, in the industrial revolution, getting it up to speed with our world and reducing that impact, not only on resources, human health and the environment to be within those planetary boundaries is such a vital thing to do. So again, music to my ears, uh, I, uh, my hats off to sustain certain the, the work that you guys are doing, and I think it's so vital. Um, how, I, I, one last comment, I guess, what, what I, I, that I have on that is, I really believe we need to provide the consumers those tools, um, but it doesn't start with the consumer. It starts with the digitization and those industries that really need to onboard those new processes so that when the consumer picks up the package, then, they can really make that informed decision, which then gives a nice feedback loop to those organizations to say, this product that, that, we're, that we're trying to sell is just not selling, uh, but it could, could be because it has a high carbon footprint, a high footprint regardless, and, and people are just not willing to move that. And so that also gives a nudge and a shift for the industry to, mm -hmm to improve their standards. So I, I love that aspect as well. Um, because, you know, I'm a, a, a food aficionado and, and trying to reform food, do you have any other positive stories you can tell us some projects you're working on specific in that industry? You mentioned there might be some more food ties that uh, you can make me aware of, or, or was that it? Yeah. I think that there's a lot of, of good initiatives that are going on in the industry. And you know, one of the reasons why this industry is, is moving uh, uh, to some extent faster than others, I think there's two reasons for that. First um, is because people uh, intuitively make the connection between food and their personal health, as well as environmental health. Uh, so that connection is, is intuitive. Uh, 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 we realize that the food we eat um, uh, 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 contributes to our own health and the way it was produced also had an impact on, on the environment. So that connection is intuitive in the eyes of customers. Uh, but also because the agri-food sector cannot continue to operate um, uh, uh, under a business as usual, as usual scenario, our soils are being depleted. Um, uh, soil erosion um, uh, is driving um, uh, productivity uh, losses. And so unless we um, uh, change course right now, we know that we won't be able to continue uh, to produce as much food as we are producing now, that we won't be able to, to feed a growing population. So that transition uh, in the agri-food sector is, um, 
uh, uh, is necessary and, and, and imminently necessary. And, and that awareness is rising. And that's why the sector is, um, uh, is moving. Uh, uh, it's a matter of survival for, for the sector and, um, and, and companies are, are aware of the challenge. That's why um, uh, they're uh, uh, looking at solving it, even though we would, we would hope that um, uh, uh, that would obviously be done uh, faster and, and on a bigger scale already. Uh, some of the really interesting things that are uh, happening right now and on which we're working on are um, uh, in the cacao sector. Uh, we're working with our partners in a number of countries in Africa uh, to verify uh, uh, the footprint, um, the carbon footprint of cacao beans that are being produced and harvested uh, um, uh, it's, a, it's a really great, fantastic program. Uh, one of the first, uh, actually the first one to achieve uh, verification under the value chain initiative. Uh, we're extremely proud uh, of the work uh, accomplished there. Uh, and we're also looking at other type of crops uh, in the US, uh, uh, as well as red meat uh, in Australia. Uh, and so it's really interesting because uh, uh, in the US, in Africa and in Australia on those three different uh, commodities, we're seeing the same willingness to work with farmers on the ground, share the value with, with farmers, uh, uh, the carbon value of their production, um, uh, share it with farmers and, and um, uh, uh, valorize it uh, uh, through uh, uh, the supply chain towards uh, end consumers. Uh, so that's, uh, that's really fascinating. Um, uh, and we're, we're expecting to see uh, a lot more uh, uh, momentum there. Uh, uh, what remains uh, uh, slightly difficult in the agriculture sector, especially when working with smallholder farmers, uh, uh, it's, it's the complexity and cost associated with the monitoring of, of what's happening on the ground. Uh, how can you be sure that, that practices uh, are being um, uh, implemented the way you would, you would expect them to be to, to maximize the carbon that can be sequestered in the soil? Uh, so here again, we're looking at technology. Uh, uh, to help us simplify our monitoring requirements, um, uh, make it more cost effective, more manageable for farmers, uh, and at the same time, increase uh, in accuracy. Uh, and you know, one of the reasons why we're seeing so much uptake uh, for our work right now is because there's also the growing uh, understanding and realization that if the impacts that you're claiming to have achieved, uh, if those impacts are not verified, well, they're not true. The only way a company can credibly communicate about uh, uh, their climate and, and sustainability achievements and impacts is if they are having those impacts independently verified uh, against an internationally recognized standards. And so working with the gold standard on one hand and working with the greenhouse gas protocol on the other hand, verifying the impacts of those companies against those two standards uh, uh, is helping uh, uh, drive, um, uh, drive change uh, by pushing for more um, uh, uh, credibility and more uh, independent verification in uh, uh, sustainability claims. Uh, because at the end of the day, we know there's also uh, uh, a lot of greenwashing unfortunately happening in that space. Uh, and That's so, exactly what I wanted to just mention. Yeah, there's a lot of greenwashing happening in that space. So if as a corporate, you're not having your impacts uh, verified, then uh, we can't know for sure that what you're claiming is true. If it's not verified, it's not true. In this world of, you know, fake news and misinformation and greenwashing, it's a uh, wonderful to hear you know that that you're doing this but it, it is common sense and I, I think those those industries and uh, people who are, are doing this uh, and on looking really realize that there is a standard there is a, a way to verify and uh, it's it's much needed one thing with the greenwashing is I've seen a trend I've been at this for a while and I've seen a trend that companies that even um, do a half-hearted greenwashing effort for a while, after about a year or two of doing that, they actually realize that 
this fake it till you make it principle that that it is a better model that they're getting response out of something that they're almost faking or greenwashing and it pushes them to eventually get fully on board and to do it the right way uh, i've seen that with numerous cases uh in the past and so that's a nice trend that i like to see i i, I even don't mind you know go ahead fake it till you make it greenwash for a while because you'll realize that you'll get more resonance from your your clients your your coworkers your your organization that it's actually a better model which which have really seen some great examples uh, in the past this year uh, was really supposed to be the decade of action right uh, 2020 uh, started off with a huge bang and a lot of momentum around uh, climate action and things that we're doing. And I was at a DLD in Munich uh, at, a, at a, an event on the road to Davos. So I was getting ready to go to the World Economic Forum uh, on a tour to Davos uh, doing other events. And I was at DLD in Munich and just two days prior to um, getting on stage at DLD, Microsoft made an announcement that was a, um, an announcement that a lot of people weren't aware of, really didn't know, didn't listen, it's had some noble numbers in it that we're not sure we understand. They said, you know, $1 billion uh, climate fund and a, uh, there, uh, by 20, um, 30, 20, yeah, I think it was 2030, they're going to go carbon neutral, not yeah, negative. That's right. And, and then the one that everybody missed, which is the most important, and that's the question that I have for you, or maybe something I'd like to discuss, is they say, we're going to remove all our historical carbon emissions since we've been in business by 2050. Now, that is a real noble thing to say, but most people, I'm not sure, can grasp what that means. Since they have been in business, 19 what uh, 40 something or maybe no may, no I think 19 I can't remember how long they've been in business but since Microsoft has been in business everything that they produce they're going to remove those historical carbon emissions yeah. that's a historical precedence and it really set the year off in in the right way uh, to move with this I believe that instead of doing the bare, bare minimum hitting the standard of where the industry set, let's just remove our emissions or let's, um, we're going to stop emitting by 2030 or even 2024 or 2025. You know, a lot of companies say that we're gonna stop our carbon emissions or, uh, or we're gonna remove our plastic by this time. That's just basically going slower in the wrong direction until one point they're still doing harm and they're only stopping or reducing their emissions to that point. Now Microsoft comes on board and says, we're going to remove our historical carbon emissions since we've been in business. That's a precedence because now all the big players, you know, Google, Apple, uh, Amazon, et cetera, can, can follow and say, yeah, since we've been in business, we're going to go that extra step, leave the world better than we found it. We're going to clean up those emissions so that we can get closer to the balance where we truly need to be. How do you feel about historical carbon removal uh, and, uh, and emissions through an offsetting program? Do you have measures in place if a company comes to you and say, hey, we've been in business to this, we'd like to purchase carbon credits, we'd like to do something to make sure we offset our historical emissions, but we also want to do uh, need some help with some actions to get us there. And that, that's a great question, Mark. It's, it's exactly why companies like Microsoft need a company like SustainCert. Um, SustainCert can confirm that Microsoft and the likes of Microsoft are indeed delivering on what they said they would deliver. In the absence of an independent verification by SustainCert, we'll never know whether those are uh, uh, fake news or real news. Uh, uh, fake impacts or real impacts. And so that's why our role in that space is so important. To your question on removal, yes, removals are extremely important. We need to, to, to take carbon out of the atmosphere. Uh, that, 
Uh, there aren't enough removal based carbon credits available in the carbon markets right now. There's a shortage of good quality removals for two reasons. Uh, one reason is, is because it's, it's really um, uh, more complex uh, 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 to quantify uh, removals and uh, confirm or ensure that those removals would be uh, sequestered for a long period of time, for long enough especially in the context of agriculture. Uh, and the second reason is that um, uh, uh, in many cases, removals are also more expensive to achieve uh, than reductions, especially if you consider uh, soil organic carbon interventions, which can be quite uh, um, uh, cost, uh, uh, costly or, or even technology-based removals. Uh, uh, so with the emergence of pledges um, uh, likes, um, uh, like the one uh, that we heard from Microsoft earlier this year, uh, to be completely carbon negative and remove from the atmosphere the entire emissions since they were uh, uh, incorporated. Uh, uh, we're definitely going to see uh, a lot more innovation and a lot more uh, uh, supply of removals uh, uh, in the market, but this is going to take time. Uh, and with gold standard, we're, we're working very, uh, very hard to develop new methodologies uh, that will make it uh, easier uh, uh, for removal based activities to issue carbon credits. Uh, however, uh, it's important to communicate the, the, the message very clearly that removals need to be permanent, uh, that there needs to be really clear safeguards in place to make sure that there will be no reversals, that the ton of CO2 that was sequestered from the atmosphere is going to be sequestered for 100 years or more. Uh, uh, otherwise, we have a problem. Uh, and so that's why working with a standard like gold standard gives us the reassurance that we're aiming for the highest bar and that we're verifying against uh, the highest bar. Do you believe that in the future, um, not just carbon markets or carbon credits and, and uh, the, the carbon is the issue, but we will bring into the umbrella of this all greenhouse gas emissions? or have something similar so because we're, we're realizing especially in the agriculture seafood and beverage industry methane plays a huge role and in, in the short-term effect it's a little more powerful than uh, carbon absolutely and and those gases are already covered so when we talk about carbon emissions or greenhouse gas emissions we include the six gases that are uh, captured under the kyoto protocol uh, and methane is one of them. So, so methane is, is for sure um, uh, covered. Um, uh, and uh, um, as you said, in the agriculture uh, sector, uh, uh, many emissions, uh, greenhouse gas emissions are uh, methane emissions, uh, which has a, a, a global warming potential, uh, uh, which is much, much higher uh, than carbon dioxide. So it's really important that methane emissions are uh, uh, mitigated to the extent possible. Yeah. So those are already included into they that. Are. Well, that that is that is good because a lot mm. of people don't know that they think they're only addressing carbon and it's much. So I'm glad glad you uh, cleared that up because yeah. a lot of people don't know that. Mm. Um, I'm coming to we're almost uh, uh, done and I'm coming to the first real question, which is. Um, the burning question, WTF, and it's absolutely not the swear word, it's what's the future? And I, I'd like to know for you and maybe sustained cert, what's the burning question? What's the future? So, so the future for us is really uh, uh, two things. Um, uh, uh, from a, uh, a value chain perspective and, and corporate value chain emissions perspective, uh, uh, what we're focusing on right now is the uh, prototyping of our emission factor tracking system. Uh, so we'll be launching it next year. Uh, we're working with our uh, close uh, uh, corporate partners uh, 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 to design it and test it. Uh, uh, so that's really uh, the future for us because we, we believe that such a system would allow uh, uh, to monitor 
uh, track and transfer uh, uh, the carbon intensity of goods uh, throughout supply chains. And that this is what we need to incentivize uh, everyone to take action in a supply chain. So that's where we're focusing our efforts. Uh, uh, the other uh, um, uh, effort that we're focusing on is, is really uh, uh, in our carbon market work uh, as the uh, certification body for gold standard. We're launching uh, the first uh, digital uh, uh, carbon credit certification platform. Uh, so the Sustainset app uh, 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 was launched uh, uh, already two years ago, but we're constantly maintaining it and uh, uh, we'll release a new module specifically for land use projects um, in a few weeks. Uh, and next year uh, we'll uh, take uh, uh, the carbon credit certification fully digital for our renewable energy uh, project portfolio. Uh, so we're really excited at the idea of leveraging uh, 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 the power and potential of technology to bring down uh, barriers to credible impact verification and thereby uh, uh, making it uh, mainstream. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. I want to jump into the next topic of air travel a little bit and uh, gives people some education and, and um, maybe some of your inputs and feedback. Uh, January 1st, 2019, um, a, a, a big transition happened, uh, especially in Switzerland, but all, all over internationally for air travel on some standards for carbon offsetting. And there's a uh, CORSIA stands for Carbon Offsetting and Reduction Scheme for International Aviation. And what most people don't know is that uh, the United Nation has an organization that's been around since 1944. It's the International Civil Aviation Organization, which is a U United Nations specialized agency um, uh, dealing with international air travel and some things. And so uh, we've known for a long time, they've known for a long time that, that you know, we need to do something, not only on carbon emissions, but on some standardized impacts that uh, this industry has on the world. And in uh, January 2019, some things went into place, but I wanted to get your stance and feeling on Corsia and uh, what we're seeing coming and the future of travel just during this pandemic time. Not only we've been on lockdown and it's been a huge industry that's been affected, but we've also now seen things that we've been talking about the future of air travel uh, some hydrogen options are coming out, some electrical options are coming out, and there's some movements in this industry, but it really affects what you guys do, carbon offsetting and, 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 and things like that. So I kind of want to get your insights on what you think and if I've, I've surmised it right, but also how we can educate the general public a little bit more on what's going on behind the scenes and what we can do to not just uh, jump in the next boat and row to America. Sure. So, so clearly, I think put simply, th the future of, of business travels, in my view, is, is virtual conferences. Um, the future of travel, generally speaking, is a combination of virtual travels, train, and really aviation for uh, uh, distances uh, that aren't uh, uh, possibly uh, uh, covered via other means. Um, there's no way we can meet the objectives of the Paris Agreement if we continue to fly uh, as much as we are today or as we were before the pandemic. Uh, so there's a, a real need um, uh, to discuss um, uh, uh, the uh, intensity of air travel and look at ways to substitute air travels with um, other forms of travel, virtual or, or low carbon uh, uh, solutions like train. Um, hydrogen uh, uh, isn't going to solve uh, uh, the problem. Um, uh, hydrogen is, is extremely uh, energy intensive to produce. Uh, uh, you need the same amount of energy uh, to separate uh, uh, a molecule of hydrogen from a molecule of oxygen 
uh, as you the molecule of hydrogen will ever produce uh, afterwards. Uh, um, uh, so, so unless hydrogen is produced using uh, renewable uh, energy sources, uh, uh, then it's, it's not really a, a climate solution. Um, uh, so hydrogen will be a solution in some cases, uh, uh, but, but clearly not um, uh, uh, as a substitute for uh, a jet fuel, clearly. Um, uh, so really the only uh, uh, solution, uh, a mix of solutions available are on one hand reduce the intensity of uh, carbon intensity of air travel uh, by using more uh, uh, fuel efficient uh, aircrafts, reducing uh, our uh, uh, consumption of air travel, so flying less. Uh, and third, offset uh, uh, residual emissions that cannot be avoided. Um, uh, and to that extent, uh, it's important to, to uh, remind ourselves that the uh, target uh, that was set by the aviation sector is not a carbon neutral target. It's a carbon neutral growth target, i.e. starting from a baseline set in 2019 or 2020 or maybe in between. Uh, from that point on, any growth in emissions will be compensated using carbon credits. Uh, uh, but it's not completely carbon neutral because it's only the emissions that are uh, coming on top of uh, um, a baseline uh, set in 2019 or 2020. Uh, uh, so it's important to keep that in mind. Um, uh, and, and really as a, a, a as a key message, I would say that there's a need to, to have a real conversation on, on uh, um, uh, real substitutes uh, uh, to air travel. Um, because if we can uh, uh, avoid to fly, uh, then we can um, uh, reuse those offsets for other, uh, uh, for other needs uh, uh, and get closer, uh, quicker to our Paris goals. Uh, and so this is really the, the conversation that, that we should be having, uh, even though clearly it's taboo. Uh, no one wants to talk about flying less. Uh, so the debate was uh, a position around uh, uh, offsetting uh, uh, and compensating for air travel emissions, but really um, uh, uh, we should all, uh, uh, as, as business people, uh, as well as individual, uh, we should all uh, plan to, to fly less, yeah. I appreciate uh, you addressing that and kind of explaining uh, that. That is, that, is that more sustained search official stance, or is that more your stance as well? Or it's it's clearly a personal stance. Uh, uh, clearly, at sustained search, we're trying to to fly as little as possible. This year, we we haven't been flying much like everyone else, but we we will try to continue that way. Um, uh, because you can't really be a, a, a climate uh, a climate change uh, activist or a climate change um, uh, organization and, and, and ignore the fact that, uh, uh, that flying uh, uh, is unsustainable. Uh, and so there's probably a, a middle ground to be found between um, uh, flying every week for a business conference and, and trying to fly uh, much less uh, only once or twice a year when absolutely necessary. Uh, and that's a conversation we all as, as climate change um, uh, actors, climate change players uh, uh, should be having, yeah. I'm, I definitely agree with you. It is a sensitive subject. I, um, I don't, I'm not sure I would say I disagree with you, but on in a lot of ways, the, this industry of aviation, but uh, regardless in the transportation industry, whether it's uh, uh, ships, sea, um, um, refrigerated trucking, refrigerated shipping, um, air travel, um, different types of logistic methods, getting around, whether it's for business or, or private for vacation as well, is uh, from my understanding, of uh, uh, different studies is about 15% of the global emissions compared to, it's not even, uh, if you were to combine all those together, the emissions that are uh, being emitted from those sectors, 
uh, it's only 15% of those emissions that are being produced by the agriculture, seafood, food and beverage industries, not only uh, uh, methane, but carbon and uh, nitrogen oxide and, and many other uh, uh, emissions coming from the agriculture industry. I believe in innovation and technology in that um, the, the product of the future isn't hydrogen fuel, it's necessarily how we produce the products of the future. So if we can produce, like you said, hydrogen fuel kerosene um, for jet fuel um, in a way that's using renewable energies that doesn't have that intensity and, and uh, is done with either wind power, solar, or some other form to, to produce it without emissions in that process um, at, at a scale uh, which they do, by the way, in Hamburg Airport uh, here in Germany, where I live, they use almost 100% uh, hydrogen uh, jet fuel kerosene produced just north of Hamburg in, in a production facility that uses wind and solar energy to produce the hydrogen and some kind of a new technology. And there's a big push in this area. But that there's also these uh, electric vehicle vertical takeoff uh, machines and uh, drone taxis, automated drone taxis, and, and some other electrical options coming on the market that are short hops, short journeys, kind of like a helicopter journeys that are coming around 2024, that there are some innovations out there that could really have been realized years ago, but now are kind of being pushed forward a little bit future, further. I'm hoping that that will really be addressed in our industry uh, for aviation or transport that we can continue to see our family and do business around the world um, because I'm from America and I have businesses and productions all over the world that I'm required <laughs> to uh, to see them because I love and miss them that the virtual way will not always be the fix for me. So I don't, I don't see it going away. I'd like to see a reduction in it and have it change in a different way that we, we produce it. But I strongly believe on innovation that we could do it in a way that isn't harming uh, of our planet. And so um, I don't know if there's something you'd like to say with that, but I, but I, but I believe that we can rely on a different way of innovation and digitization that we can come up with a solution like Bertrand Picard and his solar impulse airplane, even though that's not realistic for us to travel to visit family in a sol solar glider, um, but that we start thinking of how we can use clean tech ways that don't harm our planet to, to get into different places around the world. Innovation could, could solve uh, the problem, but, but it's not there yet. Uh, it's not there yet, and we're running out of time. Yeah. And so that's why, uh, as I said at the start, there should be uh, uh, a discussion on, on uh, uh, focusing maybe air travels on, on, on uh, travels that are, uh, uh, can't be done with any other alternative. Uh, and if we, uh, as a global community, agree to that, uh, then you'll be able to fly back to the US to see your family because in Europe we'll have built a much better, more efficient uh, railway system that will allow me from Zurich to travel to Amsterdam or Hamburg by train uh, uh, and avoid uh, uh, flying there. Uh, if we can do that, if we can maximize uh, the use of other lower carbon transport modes, uh, 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 on those uh, occasions, then um, international flights uh, will remain uh, 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 sort of possible within uh, uh, the one and a half degree budget. Um, uh, that's, that's the best solution we have right now, rather than uh, technological innovation, because uh, 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 we won't have anywhere uh, uh, in, in the near term uh, a, a low carbon flight from Hamburg to the US. Uh, it's not going to happen uh, uh, in the short term. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, so, so the solution is really um, uh, 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 sort of getting out those flights that can be avoided with, um, uh, uh, with rail transport and, and other uh, 
solutions like virtual conferences for for businesses yeah, for sure yeah and and you know really to 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 close maybe this conversation mark on a on a call to action and and on a positive note i think it's it's true that we will all have to uh, uh, to change uh, uh, our um, uh, uh, our behaviors uh, our way of living uh, uh, but 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 for the better uh, 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 climate change uh, uh, is could be our last uh, uh, battle as a global society, simply because if we fix climate change, we also fix so many other global problems we're facing, like biodiversity loss or poverty. If we do it well, uh, uh, then our society will be transformed for the better uh, uh, and we'll enjoy a, a cleaner, uh, uh, healthier, uh, happier lives. Uh, uh, so that battle is, is worth fight, fighting for, uh, and it's worth considering uh, uh, changing our lifestyles uh, uh, to reach uh, uh, a, new, um, uh, uh, a new society uh, uh, that would be uh, uh, happier, uh, uh, cleaner and healthier uh, than the one we have now. I totally agree. And uh, don't worry, I was obviously going to always try to end on a real positive note and uh, by no means is uh, flight shaming or our future of aviation supposed to be negative in any way. It's uh, things that we need to be thinking about. We should have been thinking about them years ago so that we could be prepared. And and when I hear that the uh, Corsia and also the the UN International Aviation uh, uh, Area has been around since 1944. Um, you know, a lot of talking, a lot of uh, discussion, and, and now it's time to implement well, well beyond time to make some implementations and get us prepared for the future. Uh, um, that's why I asked the question, what's the future? A lot of people are waiting for the future to be delivered to us. and. Uh, we are all empowered to, to deliver the future and build the future, create the future we'd like to live in and be in. And we don't need to wait for others to, to deliver it to us. Uh, in some respects, that could be very depressing or dystopian if we do. The thing that, that you started off on with uh, your introduction, telling us a little bit about yourself is really how I wanted to end our discussion because my heart of hearts, I know that uh, one of the biggest ways to draw down our uh, global warming and greenhouse gas emissions and um, change and make an impact on our climate and our world and, and uh, human health is by empowering women and girls. And you're a very powerful woman who has uh, done amazing things in our world. Um, but I I would like your view and your stance for my listeners to explain why is empowering women girls such a powerful, more than 75% uh, impact on drawing down the, some of the global grand challenges we're having today, especially around human health and our environment. Yeah, absolutely. Women and, and, and girls are, are first and hardest hit by, by climate change, uh, but they're also part of the solution. Um, uh, women all over the world uh, uh, make uh, lifestyle decisions. Uh, they make purchase decisions. Uh, they make um, uh, 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 investment decisions. Empowering women to, to, to make more of those decisions would lead uh, uh, to uh, uh, more sustainable behaviors. Uh, uh, there's a, a wealth of evidence showing that when women are empowered to make decisions, uh, um, uh, 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 the patterns become more sustainable. Uh, if you empower girls to go to school, uh, 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 be educated, uh, uh, get a job, uh, uh, they will change their communities uh, uh, and their families for the better towards more uh, uh, sustainable behaviors and attitudes. Uh, so empowering women and, and, and giving uh, to all women uh, uh, across the globe uh, equal access uh, to education, to employment uh, 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 is, is a really important solution in, uh, in fighting climate change. Uh, um, and and it's, it's a solution that is uh, 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 not sufficiently uh, uh, supported and explored. Uh, 
so I, I welcome the opportunity to, um, uh, uh, to talk about it here. Uh, thanks for that, Mark, because it's true that um, uh, we don't talk enough about the role that women and girls can play in, uh, in fighting climate change. Uh, uh, from a climate mitigation perspective, but also from a climate adaptation and resilience perspective, uh, uh, women can help uh, families and societies adapt uh, to climate change um, uh, uh, through uh, farming practices, uh, 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 changes in, uh, in lifestyles and, um, and, uh, and community um, uh, uh, choices. Uh, uh, women are a, a powerful uh, driver of positive change and, uh, and an immense source of um, innovation and, and climate related solutions. I totally am in alignment with you and I, I couldn't have said it better myself. I would like uh, three little sustainable takeaways for my listeners. Um, it's kind of your gift to, to them that would empower them or help them. If there was one message you could depart to our listeners as a sustainable takeaway that has the power to change their life, what would it be, your message? I would say three things. I would say the first thing is to talk about it. Talk about sustainability with your friends, with your family, with your colleagues. Uh, we, not, we need to talk about it much more. And don't hesitate to cover the sensitive or taboo issues like flying. Should we fly less? Should we eat less, less meat? Having those conversations with, with families, friends, and colleagues can be extremely uh, 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 insightful and, um, and uh, fulfilling. Uh, the second thing is take action. Uh, don't wait for tomorrow. Don't wait for uh, uh, another opportunity. Every small action is, is, is good to make and to take. Every small impact uh, is worth it. Um, if you really have to fly, then fly, but offset your emissions by uh, purchasing gold standard carbon credits. Uh, if you like meat, then continue to eat meat, but consider eating less meat uh, that's coming from uh, your country or your town or as close as possible to where you live. Uh, uh, your choices every day uh, uh, are making a, a difference. Um, and so every one of us can drive change. And then the third thing that I would say is, let's stay optimist, optimistic, let's, let's be optimistic. Uh, it's too easy to, to uh, uh, um, be, uh, uh, think about the doom and the gloom uh, uh, that come with climate change. Uh, uh, but the reality is that innovations are uh, happening every day. Positive change is happening every day. Uh, uh, as a global society, we can overcome uh, uh, the global um, climate challenge. Uh, we can do it for the better. Uh, uh, if we stay optimistic and uh, take action and talk about it. Great. What, what, what have you experienced in your professional journey so far that you would have loved to know from the start for, for those now just starting out on the journey or new startups or new people in, in sustainability? What could you depart with them that you say, wow, I wish I would have known this from the start or had, had experienced that? It's, it's a good question. I would say I hadn't realized how, what I wished I had known earlier or realized earlier is how technology can really simplify uh, the impact verification process. We spent uh, seven years uh, in Cambodia working with SMEs and NGOs, uh, filling up uh, carbon certification documentation. Uh, if I had realized that technology could be such um, uh, an enabler of, of simplification and, and uh, cost effectiveness and higher accuracy, I would have embraced it earlier. Um, uh, uh, so I would, I would urge everyone to, to consider um, a technology enabled solution uh, uh, that can uh, uh, give us the opportunity to scale solutions uh, uh, much faster. Uh, the other thing that I hadn't uh, uh, considered initially was the, 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 the power of um, pre-competitive uh, collaboration uh, to solve global challenges. Um, there's too much of a tendency to try and solve uh, global challenges uh, uh, within our own organization or with our very close partners. 
uh, by launching really broad multi-stakeholder pre-competitive collaboration platforms, uh, we can move much faster. We can get to scale faster and we can solve uh, problems in a more, uh, much more efficient way. And the last takeaway is, uh, is there anything that you would suggest to um, people are feeling like they're behind the gun or they haven't done enough or they're, they've been years of, of inaction or something and now are just coming to this arena or in, in this thought process? What are some things or, or, or actions or advice you could give them to help them accelerate their impact um, in your field to, to make a difference? What, what would you suggest or give them? I would say that, that really the, the three things that are important are first talk about it, talk about it in your organization with your own colleagues. If you're try, trying to drive change internally, then, then first uh, uh, create the space uh, for it to be discussed. Then second, uh, uh, take action and start small. But it's important to start uh, action as early as possible, even if those are small steps. Uh, uh, you will learn a great deal from those small steps. And third, be optimistic and think big. Uh, uh, if you do those three steps in parallel, then, then you'll be able to overcome um, uh, uh, the status quo and create a, a positive momentum for, for change. I've been uh, using yours and other services for a number of years now. And um, it's really, I, 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 before I started, I thought, wow, this could be expensive. I'm bracing myself for this. <laughs> and, and that's kind of a, a misnomer, I think, that a lot of people don't, don't know because they haven't looked into it. They just assume, okay, well, that, you know. Um, but would you agree it's really, to get started, to take some action, even on some small steps, it's really not that bad. The Absolutely. pricing is is, yeah. is, in, is in 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 ratio that uh, that's a good way to start. That uh, don't panic, don't worry. It, it'll be you can afford it. You know. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Great. All right. I really thank you so much for your time. Unless you have any questions for me or uh, anything you would like to ask me, I'd like to tell you thank you so much for your time. And it was wonderful to have you here on the show. Thanks, Mark. It was a pleasure. Have a good day. You too. Thank you very Bye, much. Bye-bye.